Yeah. All right. So, so um, to everyone joining in, let me just tell you what food styling means to me in the simplest, most layman words. So food styling is the art of creating visually striking food images and selling them in the best way possible to your viewers. Now, this could be images that are created for Instagram, for Pinterest, for Facebook. It could be images created for cookbooks. It could be pictures that a restaurant wishes to print on their menus. It could be pictures for magazines, editorials, for uh, TV commercials even. So there is a lot of application of food styling, but there is a certain process in how you can proceed with food styling, certain essential composition techniques uh, with which you can progress over time. So there are certain, um, uh, if you can move on to the next slide, Perry. Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, to people that are just starting off as food photographers, as well as people who've been doing it for a really long time and are already established food photographers, this particular compositional technique is absolutely important. Minimalism in food photography. Now, there's always merit in approaching a certain picture with a less is more attitude and thereby embracing minimalist food photography. Now, in food photography, this means solely focusing in on the subject that really matters, the food that you're trying to sell, and not rather cluttering your frame with too many props, because those props are just going to be doing storytelling, as food styling is all about storytelling. However, minimalism lets you focus in on every single element of the food. For example, if you're using garnishes like coriander leaves or basil leaves, even a single blemish or a brown or black spot becomes very noticeable. If you're shooting a sponge cake, whether the cake is dry or moist, uh, whether the plate that is housing the particular uh, pastry or a slice of sandwich, whether it's too large for that particular food, whether there's a lot of negative space that's happening around the particular food element itself. So all of that really, really uh, matters. Um, and every single element is shed light upon when you observe minimalism. Now, how do you go about minimalism? It's quite easy. There are certain steps that you can follow. So if you move on to the next slide. Okay, so just to get started with minimalism, um, let's decide the kind of props that we want to come to picture. So um, when I say props, I would also include background, the kind of backdrop that you're using as a part of the prop. Uh, now, the whole idea of using props for food styling is storytelling because every single element has to matter and has to be able to contribute to the picture and do some storytelling about the food element. But it also means that no single prop can take away from the food picture, can take away from the food element, it can be a distraction. Similarly, if you are someone who embraces bright food photography in your feed, now planning an Instagram feed is really important. Sometimes my clients, potential clients, would rather just ask me for my Instagram handle as my portfolio rather than asking me for a website link. So, so that's how important your Instagram feed is. And you need to plan it really well, much in advance. So if you have certain 9 or 12 bright food photography pictures or dark food photography pictures, whichever uh, mood you prefer for your feed, the kind of backdrops that you choose really, really matter. So if you're going for a brighter setup, uh, let's take this example itself, uh, a very pastel pink and slightly uh, much brighter base as the backdrop, uh, just making sure that it's all following a monochromatic color scheme throughout the picture. It's all different saturation points of red moving towards pink, which we will also be speaking of later, color theory. But just to make sure that the background is not taking away from my food, from the cake. Uh, the cake is the very first thing that I want my viewers to see. And thereby, a very heavily textured backdrop can be a massive distraction. So let go of heavily textured, very clear backdrops. However, if you are still hell-bent on using a very textured wooden backdrop, just make sure that the aperture that you're going with should be very low so that uh, it only focuses on the food, the cake, for example, 
and the backdrop is just giving a mood or the vibe of the frame it's not being extra clear and those little bits of imperfections are not very visible because if you're able to make your picture perfect prior to editing you don't have to do much while editing that's how i've always believed in shooting my pictures so that's about the backdrop whether you go for brighter or dark food photography uh, now we come to something called a primary prop now a primary prop is the main dish the plate or the bowl that is housing your uh, plate of food so if it is uh, in this example a cake my primary prop would be the cake base that you can see right underneath the cake if it is a laksa soup that i'm shooting the kind of bowl that i use larger bowl shallow bowl deep bowl uh, that becomes my primary prop now even when it comes to primary prop the same rule as that for backdrop supplies that you cannot be going with a very contrasty colored a uh, primary prop it cannot be heavily patterned or textured just for example if you're shooting a salad and you know there are a lot of different colors and textures in salads that's the beauty of a salad however if the salad is plated in a deep bowl which has a lot of different colors and polka dots and a lot of different things happening on it it's very easy to miss out on what you're trying to sell so you may get a comment on instagram saying oh how pretty is that bowl that should not be the first comment the first comment should be that salad looks wonderful but i'm curious about the bowl so that's where the choice of primary prop again it's very safe to play with whites blacks depending on bright or dark food photography again when it comes to colors go with very subtle colors like baby pink sky blue um yellow okay but avoid using too much of a uh, green maroon or uh, orange because these are colors on the color wheel which are which can very well take away from your subject uh, and use those colors only if it's um, it's the kind of brand color that uh, you're shooting now after we move on uh, from primary prop we move to the secondary prop a secondary prop would be certain dip bowls or the kind of cutlery that's uh, going to be used in the frame again making sure that it's following a similar color pattern um for example over here uh, the cherries that are slightly cropped from the frame they are following the same color uh, scheme as that of the top of the cake it's a cherry compote that's been placed on top and thereby just to have some a uh, similarity to the color and to break the overall brightness those cherries have been strategically placed similarly if you can see this beautiful piece of satin pink cloth that's in the background again it's following similar color pattern a different saturation point of red moving towards baby pink uh, but slightly more bold it's just adding that little bit of drama that little bit of luxury to your frame because this cake itself is very luxurious so to amp it up and to not fill in with far too many props it's just slightly placed in the corner with that particular fold with that little bit of highlight which is actually very welcome so just make sure that any kind of prop that you are using has to be very relevant uh, if it does not make sense if it doesn't look good just get rid of it just focus on the food and the backdrop and once you feel you are a little more confident about um, minimalism and you're a little bored of minimalism you can start introducing one prop two props more again making sure it's not taking away from the food now that's about um the kind of props that you should be using now we move on to layering uh, especially now with this particular cake or i did mention this laksa curry so let's talk about the curry um on a particular curry curries are very difficult to shoot um and i uh, i have faced a lot of issues with shooting curries however it is the garnishes that make all the difference so if you are purchasing um coriander leaves uh, coriander leaves or mint leaves or basil leaves or chilies make sure that you're buying them from the market just a couple of hours prior to the shoot 
you're placing them in a bowl containing iced cold water again in the fridge or outside it just have to be has to be really iced uh, just so it doesn't get any brown or black spots and the leaves don't wilt so when you're using them in the frame they already have those little droplets of water which reflect the light falling on them so beautifully um as well as they look really fresh and it just breaks the monotony of that curry and amps it up and how so whatever layering that you are using will differentiate from a good curry to a from a good well short curry to a badly short curry uh, so your layering really matters um and finally we move on to negative spaces now a lot of people do not resort to negative spaces and love crowding their frame with too many props now why negative spaces are important firstly is uh, negative spaces bring your viewers eyes to the subject to what really matters which is the very first thing that the viewers should be seeing and secondly it gives your viewers eyes a certain area to rest upon a certain breathing room for the viewer uh, now this is very important again considering that salad also because i love shooting salads now since there's a lot of colors in a salad and if it's a very heavily zoomed in shot it's a minimal shot there's not much props around if there are certain negative spaces in the top left corner bottom right corner it's just adding to that little bit of breather that the viewer needs so negative spaces just use them in any and every kind of compositional setup you're going with and it's going to add to a further advanced aesthetic appeal to your feed um so that's majorly about minimalism now we can move on to the next slide there are certain examples of minimalism if you look at the example on the left side uh this is a very domestic uh muffin um uh, and you can see that it's really moist it's the very first thing that i notice it's a muffin and this beautiful drizzle of strawberry coolie from up top and as well as how moist the sponge is it's not really dry so i have achieved that part of minimalism secondly if you look at the backdrop now you can see it's a rather uh teak wood that i have gone with so it is generally heavily textured um and it's also been used to give that homely domestic vibe uh to the frame and not make it look very fine dining because that's not how this muffin even looks it's very comforting um so with that particular backdrop to make sure that all those blemishes on the wooden board are not very visible i have gone with an aperture of 3.2 so an app, a very low aperture helps you focus on what really matters here because you've gone for minimalism it's just that drizzle of strawberry over the muffin whereas the background is just adding to the vibe of the frame and i almost don't even notice the primary prop which is a really good point um it's just something that i notice after i have um heavily focused on my subject so it's again following a very monochromatic color scheme similarly there are a lot of negative spaces giving my viewer some breathing room similarly with the example on the right side it's also following a monochromatic color scheme there is a lot of negative space and because the subject itself is very busy it's a freak shake there are uh, sprinkles there is a logo there are these toasted marshmallows as chocolate work and this glass so there's a lot happening in the subject itself which is why the only additional prop used here is what has already gone on top of the freak shake that is the only bit of color that's around also shot at an aperture of 3.5 thereby just getting a vibe of the whole frame and not and making sure that it's not very very distinct uh so this is entirely about minimalism which is the first compositional technique that we've learned so far now we can move on to the next one yeah uh so there is something that really bothers me every day there are some food bloggers who love um cluttering an image so much for example if it's a pizza flat lay okay if it's a, a really decadent pizza and because you cannot think of additional props to use around you would just scatter a lot of chili flakes and oregano and wilted leaves all of it um, i mean that's not even how it's going to come to your table 
right? So it's not inviting. It is messy, but also dirty. So um, when it comes to the kind of mess that you want to embrace, it has to appear like a very natural scatter. Now, if you look at this image, my subject are these really tiny cookies, but there is very little bit of mess around. There's a uh, the little bit of the cookies that have been placed on the foreground as well as background, just to show that this cup was heavily piled up with these cookies and one or two have just fallen. So it looks very, very natural. Similarly, there are those little bit of coffee beans that are scattered, but also cropped from the frame on the left, not given much importance to, but also doing storytelling, thereby telling you that this is a coffee flavored little butter cookie. And finally, that little bit of milk, which is not even distracting because it's very neutral. It's very white in color. It's just doing the storytelling further of giving you a rather breakfasty setup. So the kind of mess that you want to embrace is very different from something that looks really, really dirty. Uh, so just avoid, just have some kind of restraint in filling your image. Just make sure everything looks very clean and it's something that you would want to dig into. Uh, we can move on to the next one. Yeah, this is really uh, helpful, especially if you are a recipe blogger. And this may not be majorly for Instagram as much as people who like to have uh, recipe blogs or recipe website. Now, um, say I am a new viewer uh, of your website, of your recipe website. Um, I, there is a lot of details in a particular recipe, a lot of ingredients and a lot of steps of method. But to me, it just seems rather boring. I would just rather move on to another recipe with three or four steps. That is the basic human mentality. So in order to avoid that, just fill that particular recipe page with as many uh, alluring pictures as possible. So just try to put in a step-by-step -step recipe and when the viewer feels, yeah, this looks very doable. Uh, I have this particular ingredient in my pantry. This method seems very easy. Only once, once that dawns upon your viewer is when they would want to read the step-by-step -step ingredient list and the methods. So your job is well done. Now, how you can apply this to Instagram is Instagram has this carousal option where you can add in a good amount of shots, 10 shots, I think, or, or even more, perhaps. Um, in this case, if, if it's a cake that you're trying to shoot, um, and I love shooting desserts, I love shooting uh, French pastry. So um, say you're wanting to build a step-by-step -step story with a particular uh, cake. The first shot can be the finished cake that you're trying to sell, a very well-styled, minimalistic uh, uh, setup of a particular cake. Second shot can be you as a baker just standing behind the cake, behind the table, and trying to um, cut, trying to make a slice of that cake with a knife. The third shot can be your um, a spatula or your palette knife bringing that cake slice out and you zooming in on the cake slice on the individual layers just to show the people uh, what are layers, what is, the, uh, what is the filling, if there's fruits, if there's nuts, all those little details are noticeable. And the final shot could be a child digging into the cake, enjoying it, thereby just adding some drama and just some life. So you're able to stand out amongst a lot of other cake shots out there and you're able to convey a certain story your image looks alluring and you are going to end up uh, ranking higher on instagram when it comes to traction so that's forming a certain step-by-step -step story in conveying uh, your storytelling uh, the next shot please next slide yeah so um, a lot of people that are joining in who are maybe not well versed with uh, photography or compositional techniques here is something that will eventually be your best friend if you try to understand and try to practice it. It's called rule of thirds. Now, there's a lot of different rules when it comes to photography in general, but the, the specific rule that is practiced majorly in food photography from everything that I have witnessed so far 
um, is the rule of thirds. Now, when your uh, setup is ready, when your camera is mounted, camera or phone, whatever it is you use to shoot, is mounted on the tripod, your frame is divided, in, is divided by certain lines into certain sections. Now, this is called a grid. Now, there are multiple grids available. There are far too many lines that can create grids, but the easiest grid to follow and which follows rule of thirds is this one on the top that you see where the frame is divided by four lines into nine different rectangles. Okay, so rule of thirds states that you will place your subject on any of the four intersection points, any of the four intersection points, or any of the four corners, any of the four corner rectangles. So again, I'm repeating rule of third states that you can place your hero, your subject on any of the four intersection points or along any of the four corners. Now, the whole idea of this is to differentiate a very aesthetic shot from a very um, product placed shot, something that you would see on a billboard, perhaps uh, something that may work for food photography, but doesn't really work for your Instagram game because Instagram is all about little imperfections, not being picture perfect, just straying from, uh, you know, having everything all white or a single color and product being right in the center. So you want to avoid that. And that's where rule of thirds comes into picture where it's slightly off center. So just considering these two examples. Now, both of these images would belong on the grid right next to each other because they are both following rule of thirds. Now, I have purposely not drawn lines on the image because I want you to imagine. Now, as per the rule of thirds, in both the images, the main subject, which is heavily in focus, is occupying the bottom right intersection point as well as one part of the corner. So at least one intersection point has been occupied by the thing that is focused really well. Um, and everything else arranged around is blurred out and cropped from the frame. So they are arranged in lines that are perpendicular or parallel to the subject. But you don't have to get into that because we really want to start with minimalism. If you're just starting out, you really want to focus on minimalism. So make sure that your subject is occupying one of the intersection points. The bottom left and bottom right intersection points are the most commonly observed intersection points. And everything else arranged uh, around it is not in the same line as the subject. It's maybe diagonal, parallel, perpendicular, but crop and not so much in focus. So that's where uh, in a busy image like both of these is where um, you can go with a slightly lower aperture. Both of these were shot at an aperture of 5.6 uh, with, uh, with a strobe light. Um, and you can see the lights the light, um, the light was placed on the left side in the left image and on the right side in the right image depending on where the shadows are falling. So wherever your light is placed, make sure that you're observing rule of thirds and thereby you're adding some charm to your image, some drama. Um, so just uh, go through this rule of thirds again. I hope you're noting down most of these pointers because they are very uh, essential compositional techniques and try practicing it. So mount your camera on the tripod uh, make, uh, the, make the grid open and just arrange the subject along any of the four intersection points and things around. And you will see so much difference in your images in comparison to what you'd been posting earlier. We move on to the last uh, compositional technique. Yeah, motion in food photography. Now this really works when we are dealing with really dull colors without any garnish. Uh, and if you feel that, you know, you shot a hundred um, ice cream pictures and all of them were without any human element, without any hand, without anything that's falling or dusting or drizzling happening. Um, so with that, just to break that monotony and to give you a wonderful shot, which is a step above, which is miles ahead of everything you've been doing, you can start uh, observing motion in food photography. Now, it's really important to understand how much of the human element is a part of your frame in both the images. You can see there's just a little bit of the hand on the left side 
and uh, just the arm, uh, just the forearm on the right side. So if you are having the entire person in the shot, it's hard to focus on what really matters. You don't really know if the food is supposed to be the hero of this shot or the person or the person holding this particular plate of food. Um, in that case, it's very important to have just a tiny bit of human element in your frame, well manicured nails, nail polish or not, that is totally up to you. Creativity is subjective. So you may like something that somebody else may not like, but just make sure everything is absolutely spot on and go in for maybe icing sugar being dusted on pancakes or like you can see on the left side, there is a passion fruit curd. Uh, on the right side, there is a mango coolie. It just looks very, uh, very alluring, very enticing and uh, is getting that kind of a harsh light falling on it, thereby, you know, you're getting a gradation because there is shadow on the other side. So motion and food photography, I have observed, works really well for my feed. Uh, it gets a lot more traction than uh, images without any motion. And once you start posting, you will see that. So that was all about compositional techniques, and I hope you can start practicing them. Now we move on to another really important topic called color theory. Now, this is something that we actually studied in schools uh, while growing up. There was something called primary colors, secondary colors, tertiary colors. It's something that, you know, we have read but never really um, tried to understand too much unless you're someone who's heavily into making in, into paintings or sketches or any of the sort. So there's Far too many color theories that are out there, but the ones most observed in food photography um, and published by a lot of different journals um, are the three that you would see on the next screen, please. Yeah. So this, this wheel of color that you can see here is called the color wheel. It's just very literal. You can download this on Google. You will find it behind any drawing or painting books. Now, as you can see on the color wheel, there is an absence of white or black. Okay, there is no white or black anywhere on this color wheel. Uh, let's refer to these as non-colors for now, uh, because white is a presence of all colors and black is an absence of all colors. So these two are not necessarily colors, which is exactly why they're not on the color wheel. Now, why, why and where would you be using color theory? Um, I've been speaking a lot about how you can plan your feed and why it's so important. Because when it's a new client approaching you or if it's, if it's a restaurant page that you own and you want more viewers to you know, purchase elements from you, uh, they will first go through the entire feed. They will scroll through the free feed and try to breathe in uh, your individuality as an artist rather than opening a single image in the first go. Once they feel, yeah, this person knows what he or she is talking about is when they're going to be opening one image and liking it, sharing it, or moving on to another image. So that's where color theory is really important. Certain nine images or 12 images, odd numbers always for Instagram, certain nine images, say, are having red color as the dominant color. Okay, so if the red color is the dominant color, uh, that means all those nine images are having a lot of red. Even the props, even the garnishes, everything is red. The only color breaking that red color is a non-color. And what's a non-color? White or black. And what does that tell you? If it's a bright food photography shot or if it's a dark and moody and rustic shot. So white and black will always be the colors, uh, non-colors. Uh, thereby telling you if it's a brighter or darker food photography picture. Now, there are three color theories that are really important, monochromatic, analogous, and complementary. Let's focus on each of these. Now, in the simplest words, monochromatic color theory means by the word itself, mono, one. There's just one color that is dominant throughout the shot. If you can see on the color wheel, there are some sub colors underneath each color. Now, in monochromatic color theory, if we are going with red, for example, it's okay to use different saturation points of red throughout the shot, but the only color breaking that red would be white or black. So let's move on to the next slide, Barry. 
Yeah. So as you can see, two examples. Um, you've seen the image on the right side already. But in both the shots, um, there is one bright food photography picture. There is one darker, rustic picture. In both, the dominant color is red, and every other prop is a different saturation point of red. The only colors breaking these are non-colors. White, black. Even if it's a marble. If it's a wood, it's not exactly black, but it's tending towards black, which is um, which is the last saturation point of red or of any color. So it's tending towards black, and thereby it's serving as a non-color. So again, in the simplest words, monochromatic color theory states that you can use one color and different saturation points of that color with a non-color as the breaking color. So certain nine images can be red. The next nine images can be orange. The next nine images can be yellow or green. That's totally up to you. Just avoid using colors that are opposite the opposite each other on the color wheel, as it doesn't give the viewer a very relaxing vibe of your field. Now we move on to analogous color. If we can go to the previous previous slide uh, with the color wheel, yeah. So if you can see on the color wheel, analogous means adjacent and that means two colors that are right next to each other okay so here it can be red and red orange it can be yellow and yellow green it can be blue green and blue so colors that are right next to each other are uh, are observing analogous color theory now we can look at the examples if you can go to the next slide yeah so over here on the left side it is a play of blue and blue violet, whereas on the right side, it's a play of yellow and yellow green. And the only colors that are breaking these are non-colors. There's white on the left side, or rather the primary saturation point of blue, if I have to say technically. So white as a non-color, and on the right side is black as a non-color, and you have observed analogous color theory. So if you are not observing monochromatic, if you want to add more colors in your frame and want to stick to analogous, make sure that your entire feed is being, uh, is being practiced in an analogous color scheme. And finally, we go back to the color wheel. Um, complementary color theory and uh, exactly what it um, what it implies colors that are exactly opposite each other on the color wheel. Now, out of the three color theories, this is the most commonly uh, practiced color theory. Um, so this means red and green, and white or black as a non-color, or orange and blue, or yellow and violet complementary color theory. I mean, it's a no-brainer, to be honest. Just download this color wheel from Google. Just keep it on your phone when you are plating your, your dish, whatever it is. Even the garnishes, they are so important. Make sure that they are following the color theory that you are trying to stick to. Spend as much time with your food. Have a relation with your food um, as possible. And that's how you're going to make it sing, because food, being a humble subject, doesn't have its own voice. So it's up to you to make it sing. So let's have a look at the examples of complementary color theory. Um, so on the left side, there is red and green with white as the non-color. On the right side, there is violet and yellow green with, again, white as a non-color, and thereby you're observing complementary color theories. So all the three color theories are very, very simple, easy to observe. And the more you practice, the more well-versed you will be with all the three color theories. And it will just be instilled in your mind, right? Like right now, five years into this, I don't have to open the color wheel on my phone because it's right there. Because I have practiced a particular color composition of the color theory about a gazillion times already. So it's registered. And that's going to happen with rule of thirds or anything that's slightly out of your comfort zone, which you've not heard of, but heard of today. So that's where you know you can practice and you can try to get the most out of this session. Now from color theory, we move on to something that everyone wants to know of, um, props and backdrops. Prior to the session, a lot of people DM'd me on Instagram if I can, you know, I can decide how I uh, invest in props because it is an expensive affair, let's face it. But uh, let me tell you, uh, give you a little introduction on props and backdrops and the type 
of props that uh, are existing. So props and backdrops form the backbone of any well-styled food shot. Uh, when it comes to props, I've been speaking of primary and secondary prop a lot. Let's move on to the next slide. So primary prop is the main dish that is housing your plate of food. You will go with subtle colors, very neutral, like you can see here. It's a very uh, lighter saturation point of blue tending towards white. Uh, not too much pattern. It's very simple. Um, but the very first thing that I notice is this beautiful tart uh, with macarons with a lot of stuff happening on it. So when it's a busy subject as this, as this tart, everything else around has to be very neutral. So that is a primary prop. Moving on to the next slide. If we see everything else around is a secondary prop, but you can see that it is all strategically placed. Um, the, the mango in that little jar, the pistachios on the left side, the linen, those stacked plates, this particular knife, every has some relevance with, uh, with this particular shot. And um, it's all going to be used in the frame. So anything that is supporting uh, these partic this particular tart in the frame would be a secondary prop. So um, let's move on to the next slide. Yeah. So how do I invest uh, in props? Like, how do I decide what budget I have? Um, now, say I have a certain budget of about $200 right at the start. Um, I will list down all the props that I need. Now, this could be all props of one particular color, all white or all black, because I love doing dark food photography or bright food photography. So I know exactly what kind of props I need, whether it is a milk jug, whether it is certain plates of different sizes, whether it is bowls, whether it is cutlery. Just list down the props that you really need. And uh, once you have a list, try to look up where you can source them from. Like right now, amidst lockdown, wherever you're from, it's difficult to actually go out and purchase it. But there's a lot of people that are selling ceramics and crockery and clay pottery stuff on Instagram, a lot of small shops, a lot of shops, uh, a lot of stuff is available on Amazon or Topopedia in, in Indonesia or wherever you're from. Um, so, um, once you have purchased these within what your budget was, $200, make sure that you're exhausting the use of these over the next six months. And once you have, once you feel that you have exhausted the use of these props, is when you make another list, you have a different $200 on the side, as well as certain amount that you must have saved up over six months, which would be added to $200 so your prop list can increase you buy the, uh, these props and you end up mixing new props with the older props just so no two images on your feed look similar. Now, that is something that I have been observing for a really long time, which is why I don't really feel the kind of money crunch that I would if I was very unorganized in that manner because um, wherever you go, buying props, buying cutlery can be very expensive and every shoot has a different prop requirement. So if you're just starting off, this is the best way to go about investing in props. Now here's a certain list of essential props that you can have. You can note them down if you want. Um, so any prop uh, closet should have, you know, a, a milk glass or glasses of different types if you're shooting uh, cocktails and mocktails. Uh, vintage works really well. So if it's, um, if it's a tart you're shooting, just the tart pan, or if it's muffins, you're shooting the muffin pan, uh, or um, you know anything vintage, pewter plates, works fantastically, just uh, slightly jutted out from the frame. It looks really well. Enamelware or pottery, clay work with bowls and plates, just like I prefer to buying things in odd numbers because it works really well for my rule of thirds also. So three bowls of one particular color, three bowls, uh, three plates of a color, uh, works really well, mugs, mason jars, lots of different fabrics because you don't want to be repeating the choice of fabric that you're using, fabrics of different colors. Again, go with very simple neutral colors, no fabric with any print on it because it's just going to take away from food. 
and the cho- the use of fabric is again just to give a very either luxurious vibe or a very domestic vibe so uh, depending on that you're going to be investing in the kind of fabric that you need lots of different cake stands uh, chopping boards if you are if you have a carpenter or someone who does woodwork very close to your place just go for a local guy show him a google reference of a cake stand that you really need and he's going to make it for you it's going to be a lot cheaper than buying from amazon or any other website uh moving on to the next slide um wood block a lot of wooden um artifacts a lot of wooden bases a pizza board chopping board a uh, wooden spoons and knives um honey dippers all of these parchment papers if you're using flowers okay if you're using flowers just make sure if they are very important in the frame make sure they are fresh they have been purchased the same morning they don't even look remotely artificial however if you wish to use artificial flowers now there are some artificial flowers that look very real just make sure you're shooting at a slightly lower aperture so that the flowers are not really in focus they are somewhere in a vase in the background just adding to the emotion of the shot so that's that's where uh, investing in flowers comes into picture lots of different tea kettles um ice cream scoops vintage books or magazines work really well for coffee shots so whatever kind of props you eventually invest in just make sure that you are using them and it's not just lying some corner of your room um unused because um i mean it's just a disgrace to the to the prop that you have purchased so moving on to the next slide let's talk a little about backdrops now the four kind of backdrops that you can have uh with you one would be a rustic wood surface and i've already shown you some examples of that um again go to somebody who does woodwork or a carpenter and uh whatever wood plank pieces that are uh, fixed together whatever it is you buy um just make sure it's not varnished now varnishing is uh, applying a certain layer to smooth and make the surface look very glossy now what this does is if you're working with artificial light it ref- it hits the, it hits the surface the varnished surface and looks very glossy and it's very difficult to get rid of this per- this blaring highlight even while editing the picture so no varnishing um those imperfections just end up looking beautiful in pictures secondly mdf boards which means medium density fiber board it's basically just soft wood and hard wood that's impaneled together to give you very smooth surfaces these boards are used 90% of the time in a lot of shoots so mdf boards whatever it is they last a really long time uh, you're able to preserve them really well and i have had mdf boards which i made like 5 years ago and i still have them uh similarly with plywood now plywood is a slightly softer material so it's going to it's going to bend and it's going to go bad very very soon uh similarly with canvas canvas gets a lot of um you know blemishes and if you're using turmeric or working with chocolate it's very easy to um you know to get those prints on these particular surfaces so mdf boards are really wonderful they are safe so uh the next one is fabric okay so the choice of fa- fabric that you choose just go for uh, linens because they work fantastically um be- also because linens don't crumple that easily and um any other fabric that you use besides linen has brighteners or darkeners in them which have a lot of dyes uh, thereby the color that you see with your naked eye is not the color that uh, the camera would appreciate so um so go with linen again very subtle colors baby pink sky blue whites and the last option is chart papers chart papers work really well for product placement photography uh for um for anything where you don't really need some texture happening in the background uh so let's move on to the next slide okay so on the left side um okay so these are just how you can you know maybe create uh your own painted backdrops uh, acrylic paints work fantastically because they don't stain really easily and it's very easy to get rid of anything that's fallen on it um so just make sure you have a base color a white or black and then some colors 
and using paint brushes or brown paper bags or newspapers you can just create as many textures as possible uh with this uh similarly um uh, the the size of the backdrops 2 by 3 feet works really well for most a uh, 5 by 7 if you're shooting really large subject like a tiered cake um, or something even larger or a very wide shot with far too many subjects is where you can go with a 5 by 7 but 2 by 3 feet sized backdrops work for most most of your pictures um then we can move on to the next slide and these are some examples of the kind of backdrop so you can see on the left side there is a white plank wooden plank on the base and the back side is black now the reason for keeping it black is so that the milk which is white which is the opposite non color is very easily um, distinguished against that particular black uh, whereas the image on the right side it's a particular type of wood now you can see it's not varnished which is why there are no blaring highlights on the wood and you can see those little patches those imperfections which look fantastic actually uh similarly um there is somebody you know somebody reading a book and the just the vibe of the frame it's warm it's very pleasing and it's just very inviting so um we can move on to the next slide now and these two pictures are very very different uh from what you've seen before the previous images were slightly more domestic cafe setups where there was a lot of wood and textured backdrops now the image on the left side is again something that you know may not necessarily be used on instagram but it works really well for a food magazine it works really well for billboards it works for product placement website pictures and that was the whole idea of this shot which is why there has been no use of a textured backdrop both the colors chart papers very simple chart papers used here are observing analogous color theory but there is also a play of complementary color theory um when there is complementary and another color theory present in an image you would just call it a complementary composite a complementary composite image is where you have multiple color theories being uh, put into play um as you can see even the choice of light used here it's hard light that means say you're using a strobe light but without any diffuser without absolutely anything covering the primary source of light whatever light it is you're using it's giving a blaring highlight on the left side of the image whereas it is giving a very harsh shadow on the right side what this does it is it adds a certain contrast to the image so even when you're editing the image you don't have to work on absolutely anything but just the individual colors so that is why the kind of backdrop used here is chart papers also to be very honest i hate working with chart papers on a regular basis that's why on my feed you will never see me using chart paper unless it's for website related work similarly on the right side it's white plank it's a busy shot but you can see there is the kind of mess that's been created is very little everything has been strategically cropped everything that's not in a bowl has been placed just to show that this is my you know my breakfast or my dinner table and somebody has you know already started eating it but a nacho has just fallen off uh, and uh, you know it's it's just it's right there on my table and that's the kind of reason that's the reason why you would be using backdrops it's to show how food is going to be served to you on a dining table that's why there are going to be textured backdrops in your image moving on to the next slide the one on the left i've already showed you uh, again only chart papers have been used here to go with the pastel vibe uh, again this has been shot for a website and a food magazine which is why there's no textured backdrops as you can see and giving a very luxurious vibe whereas the image on the right side is actually something that i shot in jogjakarta indonesia um it at, at a wonderful cafe uh and i just knew this guy who was making a latte art with you know with bunny rabbit and like i never heard of that before and that's exactly what i wanted to capture uh which is why the props you see like this was not a shoot this was just something that i got from my got on my travel uh, but 
the, the place was so inspirational that you have to be super quick. If it's a busy cafe, if you're shooting outdoors, there's going to be a lot of people around. So you have to target your spot with the best natural light because you're not going to be carrying your artificial light over there. Uh, the planter, the magazine, sunglasses, everything was present. And everything was following, uh, you know, a monochromatic color theory scheme as it is. So there was not much I had to do except capture that beautiful latte art by itself. Uh, so uh, the backdrop used over here is a very natural setup. There is no strategic planning that's happened over here, which works really well if you are a photographer who does a lot of cafe shots. So... Uh, embrace the time that you're shooting uh, a cafe picture. Now, the trick here is because, um, for example, whichever hemisphere of the earth that you lie on, now India and Indonesia lie in the northern hemisphere, which is why the early half of the day till 11.30 a.m. is going to be more uh, cool. So the, the if you're shooting in natural light, the hues that you're going to uh, experience in the picture are going to be more blues and greens. Whereas after 11.30 till sunset, the hues are going to be warm, moving towards this golden hour period, which is just that one hour before sunset when you're getting this beautiful golden light. So the ideal time for shooting in a cafe, if you're wanting that warmth but not extra, would be somewhere between 12 and 2 p.m. That would just be the most ideal time to shoot outdoors. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, the last topic that I'm going to be covering, which is very short, are certain tricks of the trade. Now, a lot of people feel food stylists are all about manipulation and fake food. Now, while I don't believe in that 99% of the time and everything that you would see on my feed would be um, real elements, there are still some tricks that you can practice at your home. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the very first one being getting the snowflake effect. Now, the trick here is not to use icing sugar, but to use wheat flour, wheat flour, uh, which is used to make rotis, for example. So um, wheat, the reason being the density of wheat flour is lesser than the density of sugar, which is why sugar will fall very quickly, like microsecond quicker than wheat flour. Wheat flour will be held in the air longer. So you adjust your shutter speed, your aperture, and your light. Set that really well, but just make sure if you want to capture the snowflake effect, you're going to get it much better, more sharper, more distinct with wheat flour rather than sugar. Um, so, I mean, at the end of it, you're not going to be able to eat it. So, uh, but this is just a trick um, that I study, that I understood, and I practiced, which works really well. Uh, the next one is to get condensation on glass or say you're shooting a bowl of blueberries. It's a soup hyper zoomed in shot and you want to capture those little uh, droplets of water on, um, on the blueberries. In that case, it wouldn't just be a spray of water. Uh, you will in fact buy glycerin, which is available in a lot of pharmacies or makeup shops. Um, so you will use a spray bottle Okay, and you will add glycerin and water in the ratio one to two. So one part of glycerin, two parts of water. The reason for using glycerin is because it's oil, um, it's hydrophobic and water. So they are exactly opposite. The kind of um, the kind of body that is created once you spray it is held on the surface much longer. It's almost like using Vaseline. So it's going to be it's going to stick to the surface and even if you're shooting with four or five lights and, you know, with lights, it creates this uh, heat in, in the atmosphere and water just, you know, just evaporates or it just falls off. But that's not going to happen because glycerin is hydrophobic. Uh, so it's going to be held on the subject a lot longer. Again, you're not going to be able to eat it because it's a chemical compound, but you will get an award winning shot. Um, and finally, the last picture. Um, yeah, how to get this kind of smoke. Uh, it's, uh, it's after a lot of practice that I've achieved something like this without photoshopping it. Uh, it's with the use of incense sticks. Now, of course, if you're great at photoshopping, that's wonderful. But if you want to, you know, be a little quirky and experiment, and if you have that kind of time on your hands, just buy uh, incense sticks. I think I used nearly 40 incense sticks for this picture. 
you got to make sure that they are hidden really well which is why um, my the cups are they have certain subjects behind which are hiding the insulin sticks really well so you cannot even see them and they are cut from the edges use at least 2 to 3 hair dryers on the opposite sides uh, and um at very very large distance and you burn those incense sticks and you will see they will all move in different directions depending on the placement of the hair dryer so it is fun it takes a lot of time you need a lot of patience for this but you will eventually end up at at least one shot shoot on a continuous mode there will be one shot which will be which will bring a smile on your face and you wouldn't have to photoshop anything at all so um that's it for today uh, that's all about uh, food styling and compositional techniques and color theory props and backdrops and certain tricks of the trade and i hope you've noted down things uh, and you've taken back a lot from from this session the first session and um, i think um, we can get started with the q and a hey okay yeah, so, yeah, wow. uh, let's get a gift the applause for the all of our amazing session today wow thank you so much thank you so much <laughs> Well, so many practical things, and then wow, we are so blessed having you today. Very cool, Alo. Wow. Okay, we get so many questions, but uh, we oh, only yeah. have like uh, another five to ten minutes to answer the questions. So Perfect. I'll just str- if you guys have questions, just drop in the um, question section, so I I will read it. I can read it quickly. Okay. So, do you have a uh, trick to from the stern do you have tricks to take picture of soup for example like an oxtail soup um okay so any soup for example any liquid that you're going to be shooting it's eventually dependent on the kind of light and the direction of light that you're using so if you're working with natural light or artificial light any liquid agent works fantastically with the primary source of light being a backlight which is held at a certain angle and if you're using a reflector or a secondary source of light it can be placed slightly at a distance along where you're standing so on the left side or the right side depending on where the shadow is falling um that's about light but also very importantly uh, the rule for curries applies for soups as well with the kind of garnish that you're going to be using is fresh um it has to have the kind of color that would follow that color theory um a, whatever soup it is chilies green chilies or red chilies make sure it follows a particular color theory and it doesn't look wilted it's been purchased from the market at the same time don't um, you know mess up the frame with too many secondary props only if it makes complete sense uh, if it has gone into making the dish and if it's making the picture look more vibrant you can go ahead with that Wow, amazing! And then we have another question. Um, ah, this is interesting from Pania, Panisa Karis. Okay, how to style utensils inside the frame, and when to or not to include them in frame? Um, okay, the material of the utensils really, really matters. If you're working with artificial light, um, you know ceramics work fantastically. uh wooden surfaces work fantastically so just make sure the kind of backdrop that you're using is sort of going with the color of the primary prop rather than the color of the uh, the food that's there so say there is going to be a certain barrier between the backdrop and the primary prop and both are wooden however there is a maybe a marble slab or a jute cloth or a newspaper that's separating it it will still follow mono monochromatic color theory and then anything that goes inside the plate or the bowl uh, would be you know would be a different color would be the breaking color so um just follow rule of thirds just follow a particular color theory if you are into super bright pictures uh, even the kind of wood that you use a uh, teak wood would uh, would be a better choice than any other kind of wood because it just naturally appears more warmer in pictures and there is very little room for editing anything <laughs> i see and then we have uh, also another question which is best uh, yeah maybe in your opinion like which is best natural or or artificial light 
I think when you are starting off as a photography student or like even just uh, being self-taught, you have to practice natural light. You have to work with natural light for a minimum one year to be able to understand how temperamental it is. Like right now where I am, we are facing monsoons very, very soon. Um, and it just suddenly goes from super bright to, you know, very dark and dull. Um, in this case, it's very important for me to understand natural light. Now, there is a certain exercise that I do. Um, I would do my prop setup in one corner of the room, and I would observe the transition of natural light every hour of the day. So my camera or uh, phone would be mounted on a tripod in one place. I will shoot an image starting at 8 a.m., going on till 6 p.m. for the first two days, just to understand uh, which spot of my home has the best kind of light, the harshness, the intensity. And when I spoke of the Northern Hemisphere and cooler hues and warmer hues, uh, you will understand that exactly when you're editing the picture. So start off in natural light. Once you're confident, uh, you want to take it one step ahead. Invest in really good artificial lights. Don't go with a very cheap product. Because once you buy artificial light, it's going to stay with you for years without going bad if you take good care of it. Oh, I see. I totally agree with this. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's very practical, guys. So, you guys have to uh, do what Alok suggests. So, one year on uh, natural, natural light is very practical. And then you can just use uh, any light come from your window in your house. And then try to shoot from... 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. to uh, see the difference and uh, to see the quality of the lighting in your house. Okay, wow, it's it's very practical. And then uh, we have question about the color, uh, fabric color. Okay, uh, which color of fabric uh, maybe you start to invest? Um. So the choice, choices of fabrics that you buy, it's always good to buy all colors in one go, which are going to last you forever because you just keep ironing them over time. So just the, the basics that I suggested for backdrops as well as for primary props. So white, black, go with a cream colored, a slightly brownish colored, um, go with a baby pink, sky blue. Favorites for, uh, for Instagram work really well in almost all kinds of pictures. Avoid something like a dark blue or maroon or green or yellow or orange because these are two vibrant colors. Uh, when they're falling on the color wheel, they're, uh, they're going to be very contrasting in comparison to your subject and will take away from your subject. So the most neutral colors, be it linens, be it props, be it backdrops, stick with those because why? You know, why keep purchasing everything that's available on the market when you're never going to attain good pictures out of it? So save your money and just buy the right kind of props. Okay. So, Alok, we get so many questions. So if you continue this, then it will be <laughs> another 10 hours maybe. So, I yeah, think, true. well, I have to thank you so much for all of uh, many things that you have shared uh, for us today My and there are so many things yeah I think wow it's amazing wow okay so thank you so much so blessed to have you uh, tonight uh, with us okay thank you yeah. so much for inviting me and I'm wishing you all the best for all the other sessions that are happening henceforth um, and if um, anyone that gathered something from this seminar today if uh, you would like to uh, tag me in pictures with whatever you have attained from this workshop. I would love to see. That would be that would be a privilege. So thank you so much. Okay, and then you guys, you have to make sure that you follow Alok and then stay in touch. Yeah, maybe you you guys also have another question and then you want to discuss something or maybe make a international collaboration with Alok. So yeah, maybe just yeah. drop your idea here and then yeah, maybe you guys can also collaborate together so Alok is pretty amazing guy so it's really great to know him okay so and, thank, and I have to say your work is phenomenal and um, I'm a big fan and I have a lot of friends in Indonesia and I just keep directing your profile to them 
because um, you know when one looks for reference images on pinterest you know your profile can serve as just you know reference images for a particular shoot so it's phenomenal uh, the work that your team is also doing and uh, well i'm a big fan wow thank you so much thank you so much okay i think that's all for uh, today yeah. and then i'll I will be very happy is if one day we can meet in person or wow we will for sure <laughs> okay so okay oh. i think that's all for today uh, okay guys we also have another uh, another section uh, for the international food photography uh, conference so uh, we will be on every monday so uh, i'll see you in the next section thank you so much alok and bye bye thank you for having me bye take care Thank you.